and welcome to the, se the second session of the symposium of Open Collaboration for Innovation in Global Health. We had a thoughtful and nurturing discussion first ses in the first session focused on diagnosing the challenges to innovation and access, and the present, se the present sessions will focus on solutions. Engaging scientists with other stakeholders for open science models is seen as a revolutionary yet feasible approach to the innovation crisis of traditional pharmaceutical business models. More and more supporters of collaborative models believe that open is the future of science. Of one of our extraordinary guests, Dr. Bernard Munoz, said, from the dawn of the time, the sharing of knowledge was one of the main forces driving science and innovation. It may also be the next breakthrough in global health. When the open science movement rooted in open software models appeared years ago, its leaders were seen as innovative folks who wanted to shake up the status quo. The goal of our session today is to frame together the way in which the movement of collaboration can become the new status quo. So what are the preconditions to be met for turning open science models from private public partnerships to R&D treaties or collaborative networks into policy? As Dr. Saw said at the beginning, our session will make the transition to the next session, which will dive into specific open science models and approaches. The ultimate goal of these models, beyond rejuvenating innovation, is to reduce the gap between our worlds, which we continue to call, in a very reductionist way, the developing and the developed. For this to happen, the innovation needs to escape from the crystal ball of the elite and to engage the citizens. And this will be covered in the fourth session. And also, it must integrate the bottom billion, the base of the pyramid, which will be covered by the fifth session. So back to our session, our goal is to draw a policy framework, policy and analytical framework for collaboration. The following issues will be addressed, where and why the traditional pharmaceutical R&D models are failing and why, why collaboration is the answer, what are the associated risks and challenges to these open models, and how this risk can be managed. We benefit today from the presence of two extraordinary guests, Please welcome Dr. Berman Munoz and Judith Rias. My co-moderator, George Coronia, will have the privilege of formally introducing Judith Rias later. We'll have a period of questions for both our guests at the end of this session. But first, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Berman Munoz, the founder of InnoThink Center for Research in Biomedical Innovation, a consultancy focused on pharmaceutical innovation created to translate innovation uh, research into evidence-based business models for the pharmaceutical industry and its stakeholders. InnoThink built upon research performed by Dr. Minos in the last decade as advisor for corporate strategy at Eli Lilly, where he focused on disruptive innovation and redesigning, redesigning R&D models. Dr. Minos' work has been published in Nature and Science, but his scientific articles are openly shared into, onto his LinkedIn account. His work has inspired policymakers, regulators, and investors to rethink the pharmaceutical business model. Dr. Munoz has been named one of the 25 most influential people in biopharma today. Let's welcome him and invite him to speak. Thank you for this interaction. Good morning to all of you. And uh, thank you for Dr. So, to Dr. So for inviting me to talk to you this morning. I always love to talk to student audiences because there's so much energy and so much, so much more ideas uh, um, about how to address the challenge that we face uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very gratifying. Um, we have a fair amount of slides, so I will dive uh, right into it. Uh, well, this is the outline. We'll talk about the state of innovation very briefly because you read about this all the time in uh, newspapers. Uh, so you got a pretty good idea, uh, even if, you cash, if you're a casual reader uh, of how bad the situation is. Uh, much more interesting will be to talk about you know, the alternatives. How do we get back on track? And I will give you some example of uh, the very rich uh, ecology of novel model that have been devised and continue to be uh, invented uh, to uh, get us uh, out of this uh, morass. So we, we have a, a full-blown uh, innovation crisis on our hand. This is not new. Uh, I will not spend too much time on this slide. Basically, what this tells you is that however you look at the situation, it looks bad. Um, <laughs> whether it's the 
total amount of innovation, and you see it on the top chart, you know, it's been sliding uh, for the last 15 years, uh, and in spite of the uh, well-publicized uh, uptick in drug approval last year, uh, it really does not make that much of a difference, especially if you look at the large pharmaceutical companies. As you can see by comparing those two uh, curves, uh, uh, most of the companies uh, that have benefited from that uptick were actually the smaller companies. Uh, the, the, for the big companies, it's, it's really uh, 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 no, w well within the range of uh, the noise that we've seen uh, in recent past. Uh, innovation in R, I mean investment in R&D, uh, which has been steadily increasing for decades, uh, as far back as World War II. Uh, starting to flatten out, and uh, this, at least in a perspective of the existing model, is bad news because um, uh, basically it, it uh, um, foretells a, a, a flattening out of innovation. We didn't have that much to start with. So, uh, uh, most likely we'll have uh, even less of it if we stick with the current model. Um, but there's all the statistics that are troubling. Uh, the number of uh, prescriptions filled by generic in this country has been steadily increasing, doubling uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, last year, uh, probably around 82, 83% of prescription in the US were met by generics, meaning by yesterday's innovation. Uh, and no one is complaining, everybody's happy. Even pharmaceutical companies uh, in, uh, give incentive to their employees to use generic as much as possible. Uh, I know, I worked 30 years in that, uh, in that industry, uh, as if uh, those companies can no longer afford their own innovation. Uh, but, you know, you, you, so, and we're on track to hit 90% uh, within the next two years. So if 90% of the pharmaceutical needs of Americans are met by generics by 2013, does the industry really matter in, 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 anymore? Uh, good question. Uh, but we've seen job losses, massive job losses, 98% uh, of the sales uh, in pharmaceutical companies today, big pharma, uh, come from products that were approved in the last five years. In an industry where the patent life is, uh, you know, 11 years, it means that the bulk of the sales, uh, 230 billion, uh, that in the U.S. Uh, will become generic within the next five years or become very close to be generics, uh, uh, and uh, there's really not that much in the pipeline uh, to replenish that. So uh, it's it's very worrisome, and I will st stop there and move on to the uh, to the to the next to the rest of the presentation. One uh, very preoccupying aspect of the innovation crisis is the cost. Uh, you know, the eighty the eighty thousand dollar pill. Uh, uh, no no new drug seems to hit the market these days with <coughs> such a price tag. Uh, it has uh, basically triggered a number of articles in Forbes and some leading blogs in the industry about the truly staggering cost of inventing new drugs. Uh, what is this cost? Uh, well, this is a good question because uh, does anyone really know what it is? Uh, it, it depends whom you're talking to, basically. Uh, there's a very popular study that was published in 2002 by Jody Massey, Judy Massey and his group at Tufts, uh, which uh, totaled up some numbers uh, from data provided by the industry but never made uh, publicly available, uh, and uh, that, uh, that the estimate was 802 million. Uh, the Pharmaceutical Trade Association recently, and still to this day, keeps arguing that uh, it's about $1.2 billion. Um, now, Big Pharma are the executives who are the only one who really know. Uh, I've been talking about 1.8 billion. This is a figure published uh, actually by the former head of R&D at Lilly in Nature uh, back in 2010. But privately, I've talked to a number of uh, heads of R&D, and uh, they will readily admit that it's actually seven billions of dollars per new drug. Um, if you look at it at the macro level, public companies spend 125 billion dollars a year to produce new drugs. And for that, we're getting 10 to 25 new drugs, most of them marginal. Uh, you know, you can do the quick math, quick and dirty, but still pretty accurate. Uh, and uh, get a feeling that uh, it's, it's, it's not a very good return on, 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 on this investment. Um, if you look at the company Pfizer uh, from 2000 to 2011, 
they spent almost 86 billion dollars in R&D. And for that, where do we get? 10 new drugs. Um, it doesn't look good. Now, you've got, and I will talk about that later, some organizations who uh, have found a way to produce drugs at figures that uh, uh, are only a fraction of what the industry is spending. Uh, one of the, uh, WHO actually created uh, public partnerships about uh, 10, 12 years ago to re-energize uh, drug R&D in um, neglected diseases. So one of them uh, is the Medicine for Malaria Venture, which I've been tracking. Uh, they're doing a very good work. And um, uh, they have taken molecules all the way from discovery through registration uh, for about 85 million. So you got 85 million on one end and 12 billion on the other hand. Where, I mean, how much does it really cost to develop a new drug? Um, the figures that have been hammered, doubted by uh, the uh, industry association really only expend, uh, explain 25% of the spending. Where does the rest of the money go? Well, let's uh, dive quickly uh, into that. The first, the first point I want to make is that the cost per new drug, which is uh, a figure that I've been pursued almost with, um, uh, on which the, uh, uh, much of the industry uh, and the public has been fixating, uh, the cost per new drug is really a meaningless metric that should be abandoned. It's meaningless because, uh, uh, number one, the data is not available. So you have to rely on mostly big pharmaceutical companies who are going to give you some data and you don't know how the data has been sampled. Uh, you know, there's most likely a bias there. It's not subject to verification. Uh, and it, as we say, we just saw, it only explains 25% of the cost anyway. So why worry? Let's you know, uh, 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 move away from that metric and instead refocus on something that is easy to calculate and it really is the only thing that matters and that is how much do you get out for what you put in. R&D spending is uh, easily available uh, from companies' financial statements uh, and uh, the number of drugs that come out of the pipe is also easily available. Uh, so let's, let's, uh, let's concentrate on R&D spending per new drug. And if you do that and you represent, you know, you kind of plot those figures uh, on, the, um, uh, on, on, on the chart, as so I've done it here, uh, you know there's several things that are a bit strange and possibly unexpected and certainly disturbing, and it is, uh, it's not the normal curve. It's not the bell-shaped curve. Um, it's, it's, if anything, it looks exponential. So mathematically, you can calculate an average Practically, your average means nothing because it doesn't capture the shape of the distribution. It's just a number. You can argue that the median is a statistically more meaningful figure because you've got 50% above, 50% below, but even that is not that much better. Uh, you know, there's, there's, it's not like if you have a normal, you know, a better shaped curve where you have a mean and, you know, you know that the values cluster around that mean, so the mean really means something. Here, it doesn't mean anything. Um, but the disturbing thing is that, you know, here are a bunch of companies who purport to do the same thing, and some do it for very cheap, and others do it for a lot of money. And uh, uh, what's behind that? And uh, is there an explanation to it? Well, I'm not sure there's a lot of sense and logic to it, but I'll take you through it nonetheless. If you look at, uh, if you plot the R&D spending per new drug against company sales, uh, this is how it looks. And you can see that up until sales level of about three and a half billion dollars, R&D spending per new drug is really pretty cheap, pretty low. And starting at about four billion, it's all over the map. So scale basically doesn't do a lot to innovation. Why? One can speculate. Big companies have a lot more bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is very expensive to run. Big companies also spend a lot of money doing marketing support that is relabeled as R&D. Uh, if you look at the drugs such as Seroquel, for example, which is an antipsychotic from uh, AstraZeneca, 
which is about to go out of patents. This is why it's, uh, it's being talked about in the literature. Um, Seroquel is being supported by 72 phase three trial. In other words, late stage clinical trial that are the most expensive. 72, FDA only requires two. So it's a mystery to me what it is that the company expected to learn about this product in its 72nd phase three trial that it didn't really know about the product already. And I would venture to say that this is research that doesn't need to be made. Uh, this is not actually research. It is basically an exercise aimed at generating numbers to keep the sales people talking. I mean, if you've been talking about a product for 15 years, um, chances <coughs> are that you know physicians have long closed the door to you uh, because you don't really have anything new to say. Uh, so this is just, you know, and half of the phase 312 that, has been, that are being started or that are being done by the industry uh, have to do with products that have already been approved. Half of them. Uh, now, some of that is justified, you know, in order to broaden the label of some product, but not that much. So we've got, um, you know, more marketing-oriented uh, trial. We've got uh, more marginal drug candidates that only offer a tenuous improvement over the standard of care, and therefore in order to demonstrate that improvement, you need huge, very complex trials that are very expensive, uh, and also because the drug candidates are not very good, they tend to fail higher, so that drives up the cost. So there are numbers of perverse uh, things that are happening uh, that uh, are responsible for that situation. For what are the alternatives? Uh, I will not take you in the details of that chart. It was uh, proposed uh, uh, by uh, Jill Oldschuler at the meeting of the Institute of Medicine in 2010, and it's basically a typology of the open innovation models. Uh, and it's out of date because things are moving so fast, but uh, it tells you something just by looking at it about the richness of that ecology. And depending upon you know, who the benefits are and whether it's open or closed uh, and, and the goals and so forth, uh, you've got all kinds of stuff there. Um, but uh, so you've got the open source initiatives. Let's see if we can get that to work. Mm. Yes, you've got the open source initiative, and you can see here. You know, she's got a number of uh, of, of um, models that have been uh, inventoried. <coughs> you've got the consortia. You've got um, uh, the industry consortia, or you know, some of the uh, uh, other type of consortia. You've got the public-private partnerships. You've got you know some of the things that uh, uh, the um, you know things like the uh, Indian OSDD or the Pink Army Corporation that uh, don't fit really in any box. Uh, and you've got uh, you know prizes and incubators and you know whatnot. Uh, so you've got all kinds of uh, models that have been devised by entrepreneurs and activists uh, uh, desperate to do something and. It has basically created a market for innovation. So if you want to be an innovator today, uh, you don't need to do the whole thing from soup to nuts. You can basically choose what you're going to do depending upon your interest and your skill. And the rest of it, you can find partners out there who will do it for you. So uh, it makes it a lot easier. Oh, sorry. So we've seen um, what the, uh, you know, get an idea of the ecology. Uh, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is that the traditional R&D model, the so-called big pharma model, does produce drugs, not too many and not too good, but you know it does produce drugs, and uh, but it does so at a cost of about five to fifteen billion dollars per new drug. Uh, they're focused on blockbusters, uh, not really on breakthroughs, which is a problem. Most of what we see, most of what's approved is marginal. We've got a few breakthroughs, but not, not very many. Most of it is marginal. Uh, and uh, the net result is that uh, those drugs or those companies are basically treating fewer patients with increasingly unaffordable drugs. And this is, I would submit, not a very sustainable business model. On the other hand, we've got the open innovation models. Uh, uh, and this is a very broad term. You know, open innovation is a catch-all term to basically designate models that have one thing in common, and that is they're networked. Uh -huh. And because of that, they harvest, they harness all kinds of, 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 of economies of scales. Uh, but open innovation model, uh, and I've tracked the economics of it, and, 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 and you know, uh, tried to pin some, some numbers, uh, they basically deliver drugs for 150 to $200 million per new drug, 
So less than 10%, 5% of what it costs the large pharmaceutical companies, instead of worried about the size of the market, they're worried about science and breakthroughs. Uh, um, and they tackle, because they're more affordable, they can tackle neglecting disease, rare disease, and also by defense, which has special requirements of its own, which is actually a fascinating uh, uh, area, but beyond the scope of this uh, uh, meeting. Um, so, uh, so we've got, you know, things that are out there, and we've got some data to compare them. Uh, let's let's delve into uh, the details, and let me give you a few examples there. So, how's it, how how can it be possible that some companies can do for 85 million what some others they will require, you know, upwards of 10 billion uh, to achieve? Um, and first example here uh, is a question I'd like to put to you, and that is which you know biomedical research organization brings new drugs for 85 million dollars in your opinion? Is it NIH? Is it Pfizer? Or is it the Gates Foundation? Well, it is none of them. <laughs> <laughs> it is Medicine for Malaria, for malaria Venture, that public power partnership that was created around 2000 by WHO, as I mentioned earlier, and here is the story of uh, MMV over the last 10 years. You can see in the top chart here, their R&D spending in millions of dollars, and the number of employees in absolute numbers, not, not thousand. So you can see that they started with 10 employees, and nine actually, 10, and they were at about 10, 15 for most of their existence, they're now at 40, their R&D spending is $50 million a year. And for that, actually, you know, last time I checked, they had 42 employees. And for that, they are, you know, managing a portfolio of projects that, that range from discovery to clinical, about 50, slightly over, over 50 projects. Um, they have, now, what can 42 employees do? Big pharmaceutical companies have, I think, one of them, 18,000 employees in this research group, 18,000 versus 42. Now, 42 employees can run an innovation network of 130 partners in 43 countries. They can run 55 clinical trial sites in 24 countries, 38 ongoing clinical trials, 19 new classes of drugs under investigation. Uh, they can do a lot. And they can take a product or a compound from discovery through market approval for $85 million. Uh, and they've done that at least once with Coartem, uh, and they have two more products under regulatory review. Uh, so you don't really need to be big if you know what you're doing and if you're you know, committed. Uh, another interesting example, which company discovered drugs with no labs and no offices? takes a bit of imagination to, uh, to do that. Actually, there's quite a few companies that do that. And it's so-called micro-pharma movement, and you can see here some of their logos, and there's more that I could fit, that I could fit in, that, uh, uh, in a page. Uh, micro-pharmas are basically small, very small pharmaceutical companies, oftentimes started by veterans from the pharmaceutical industries that had big ideas and probably ideas that were too big for their big pharma employers, so they decided to leave and create their own uh, micro-pharma. They run them out of houses. Sometimes VCs give them a desk to work. Uh, sometimes they have low-rent facilities. And they always have very few employees. One guy, the chief scientist, might run the company out of his home in Silicon Valley, and then you may have a business manager who handles everything but science, who run the company out of our home in St. Louis, and they may have a regulatory guy in Washington, and that's all. Uh, and, but the amazing thing is that those, uh, micro, those skeleton company really, uh, have appealed a great deal to venture capitalists, and I've been able to run serious amount of money uh, you can see some example here. 
45 million, 55 million, 27 million, 60 million, 65, 29, 40, 17. Uh, I mean, it's hard enough to raise money in this day and age. Uh, there's got to be something to that model that is appealing to the venture capitalist. And one thing that is appealing is that every dollar that they spent, about 80 to 90 plus percent of that goes to fund science and not to fund infrastructure. In a typical company, it's not 80 or 90 percent, it's 10 to 15 percent, 20 percent if you're lucky. Next example, which research organization has changed the world with 140 scientists? Never mind 18,000, how about 140? It's DARPA. Now, you may or may not be familiar with DARPA. It's the innovation engine of the US military. The folks who brought us the GPS and night vision and the internet and all kinds of other things, most of which are classified because they work for the military. Um, those folks can really look back at the last 50 years when they've been in existence and claim that you know <coughs> they've changed the world. And they really have. They've changed the way we work, the way we communicate, the way we entertain ourselves, the way we shop, the way we invest, the way we do, uh, with the way we run our lives. Now what most people don't realize is that those folks who have changed the world several times um, only number about 140. 140 math scientists, as they are, <laughs> who operate out of a single office building in Alexandria, Virginia. They have no lab, no facilities. Everything they do has to be networked, and they do it on a shoestring. The DARPA budget, not just for bioscience, but for everything, aerospace, material science, everything, is about the size of a mid-sized pharmaceutical company, about three and a half billion dollars. The bioscience budget is only 500 million dollars. Uh, so again, um, now they've got all kinds of interesting things and, and we cannot get, unfortunately, into the details of, uh, that has made them extremely productive, um, but uh, it goes to show that you don't really need to be big um, or uh, spend a lot of money uh, if, uh, if you want to change the world, you can do it on a shoestring. Uh, another example, which organization has 5,700 scientists and a budget of only two million dollars. The open source drug discovery platform in India. Uh, this is a computerized platform that basically invites the scientists of the world to join hands in uh, discovering and developing novel antibiotics for tuberculosis. They were created in September 2008 um, as of a couple of months ago. The cumulative spending was less than $5 million. 5,700 scientists have signed on to the work. Um, there's many fascinating things about OSDD uh, beyond the fact that you know they're doing cutting edge science on a shoe string. I mean, it's hard to do cutting edge science any cheaper than that. In the four years that they've been in existence, they are now publishing 65% of the paper on tuberculosis. They've done things like re the entire genome of mycobacterium tuberculosis in four months. Uh, they are produced a couple of uh, drug candidates that are about to start trial. But the most interesting thing to me is that the person who uh, designed the model, Samir Brahmachari, uh, has a fascination about what I would call the creative and the disruptive energy of the youth. He makes the point very convinc convincingly that, you know, if you look at companies such as Facebook and Microsoft and eBay and Amazon and uh, Skype and, you know, all the other uh, uh, new age uh, network company, they have two things in common. The first thing is that they, they change the world, them too. But they, they were all started 
by 20 year old something that had no experience and no resources. So, you know, he goes to, I mean, he, 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 he hurries to add that if you really want to change the world, give it to the kids. <laughs> I mean, they really know how to do it. They've done it in the most under the most unlikely conditions. And he's become so convinced of the disruptive capacity of the youth that he has designed the OSDD platform to appeal to them and enlist their energy in order to do that. And quite successfully, I've been actually in touch with that organization. I was in India a couple of months ago uh, where I met with all the, the crew there. It's fascinating uh, to interact with, uh, with those people. Um, last example, which country has the most technology startups after the US? Is it Germany? Is it England? Japan? Or Korea? Well, it is Israel. <laughs> <laughs> Israel, small country as we know, has 4,000 active technology startups. Almost a billion dollar in venture capital funded them in 2010. And you can go down the list. Um, so again, you don't need a lot of people, you don't need a lot of money if you're doing the right things. This is my last example. <laughs> um, which organization can save 98% of the research cost? And it's Innocentive. Most of you probably know about Innocentive, electronic exchange that basically matches people who have problems with people who can find solution. Um, at the last count, they have a, commu a, a community of solvers of about a quarter million people, spanning 200 countries. You can see roughly here the, the key countries, uh, uh, those bars. And, um, but the interesting thing is that um, it doesn't work in every case. In the last 10 years, they've um, posted about 100, I mean, 1,420 challenges, and about half of them have been solved. So, 700. If you look at the way things are being done in big pharmaceutical companies, to solve a tough problem, to solve a tough problem like this, um, it takes, you know, one or two people working for one, two years. It's easily a million dollars, possibly more. So 700 problem at a million dollar piece, 700 million. Innocentive has done it for 18 million. So you do the math, it's about two and a half percent. It begs the question, why isn't Innocentive used to a greater extent than it is? And the answer is, well, nobody knows the answer. Uh, but it probably has to do with the inertia that uh, pervades uh, the organization. So conclusion, it doesn't take billions to discover new drugs. Don't let any, anyone tell you otherwise. The cost of failures and the cost of unnecessary research are the reason why it does take billions today, but it doesn't need to. Uh, open innovation has enabled a wealth of alternative R&D model. And they do the sort of things that made the pharmaceutical industry great, but that the pharmaceutical industry no longer does. They explore, they take risk, they disrupt, and they create valuable things. They have become an essential part of the innovation uh, ecosystem, and in my view, our best bet to tackle the challenge ahead. Thank you very much.